Okay, we're going to get started. Um, this is one of those sessions where that we're going into in, an impartation prayer time afterwards. Uh, I'm going to ask the students that's from my school to help pray for impartation. Um, and uh, when we get ready for that, I'll have them come up here. And I'm going to have them stand on this front step to start with. And when you come forward, if you're one of the ones God's touching to start with, we want to pray for everybody. And once you step through the doors, once you stop talking, please. Once you step through those doors, you stop talking. And if we can have maybe some ushers there to pass that on. Matter of fact, even close the doors. Thank you. So if you're one of the ones that God's touching in a way I'll talk about the end, that's what I've done for 32 years, even before Toronto, for almost a decade before Toronto. I believe that these things were happening, and we just didn't see it as much. Um, but we want to pray for everybody that's in here. When I say we, I mean my team and I together. We want to pray for everybody that's in here. It's more important that if God's touching you, that one of my team can bless what he's doing than it is for me to pray for you later after the anointing is lifted. It's important that, and, and one person cannot get to all the people that's being touched. It's more important that, and, that people pray for you and bless you. And I've prayed for them in school several times and laid hands on them. And so it's kind of like Moses and the 70 elders. When Blaine came to my church, he only had three people with him, and they were all praying for people. Uh, and and there's, it's important to see what he's doing and bless what he's doing. Now, what does that do, though, for people who have no manifestations? It means we can't know who you are. And, and I know that God touches some people, and they have no manifestations. And that's why we want to make a commitment. We want to pray for everybody. And one of the last things that I will do, except you've got to know there's a big difference between this and when God's touching it right at the front as, as people leave if you've been prayed for and uh, then I'd ask that you I don't see two ways out but anyway I usually say this way out if you didn't get prayed for come by me and I'll pray for you if you did get prayed for please go out and you can go out one of those things down that way maybe I don't know but try, don't stop for prayer a second time because we want to make sure that there's time for you to eat, other body to eat, and if there's a long line, if you already got prayed for and God touched you, then be grateful for that. Um, so before I begin, though, I want to just mention a few things. This is our book on deliverance. We had a guy a while ago from the Hispanic church just tell me how that our deliverance teaching has been so helpful for them. Uh, and this is the, the broadening. Uh, in, the, in the training manual, we have the, uh, the, the survey to take. Uh, that's actually not in this one, but this goes more into uh, deliverance. The first time I had this book in print, uh, I was in Oshawa, Canada, and a mother bought it, went home, looked at the table of contents, and decided that she needed to look at chapter 8, Curses, Intervals, Soul Ties, and Generational Curses. She read five pages, saw something she had done. Holy Spirit deeply convicted her. She's repenting beside her bed with her Bible open, weeping under the godly sorrow. And uh, she was sovereignly delivered right there. Her daughter in her 20s had had several years of schizophrenia. Um, and her daughter, without anyone praying for her daughter, and her, what her mother did set her daughter free. And her daughter came into the room. I actually had this uh, dossier this thick of psychotropic drugs and institutions she had been in. Instantly set free. She walked in. And I do not think that mental illness is usually caused by demons. I, I, that's not where I'm at. You need to know that's not where I'm at. I think it's naive to think that way. I also think it's naive for the medical field to think it can never be that. I think both would be naive positions. And in this case, we've had two schizophrenics healed in our meetings. Uh, one had nothing to do with demonic, and the other one did. 
So, uh, but anyway, that's, that's this book. If, you're, if you struggle with this issue of grace I was preaching about this morning, uh, this is two of my favorite teachings that I teach on grace, awed by his grace, and come out of the bunkhouse. Awed by his grace, my mother said once you when it printed it, she said, I didn't even want to go out and see the neighbors. You took out every skeleton, both on the Clark side and the Ray side of the family, and you prayed to them before the whole world, you know. And I said, Mom, never be ashamed of who we used to be. Amen. We're trophies of grace. Amen. We're trophies of grace. And, and so I, it's... Bill Johnson, he had, he, I didn't think he was going to, I mean, I, I shared more than I'd ever shared before, and I, I thought, well, I only shared that at Bill's church, and then I found out that Bill was so touched by the message that he sent it hundreds of tapes all over the world <laughs> of this teaching, and, and so it's in this one. The other one, Out of the Bunkhouse, is actually the story of the, the father of the prodigal son, and... Uh, so these are two very powerful. If you struggle with grace, this can really bless you. If you'd like to have a good message for your pastor, you'd like to have a good message on grace, that could be very helpful for you. I talked to the pastors down below, or was it last time? I forgot last when I was here, about uh, he, yeah, it was down, downstairs, healing out of intimacy from the upper room discourse, and then healing as acts of obedience. It's, uh, I'm going, to deliver, I'm going to develop this into a larger book on, on those two subjects. It's going to be in, Insights from the Gospel of John on Healing. And there's just two teachings on it. And um, I think that the, the second one, on, or the first one, Healing, healing Out of Intimacy, is so important. Uh, one leader from a big church in Texas told me, now it all makes sense. Now it all makes sense. I really understand it's not about us. It's about him. It's about his glory and how we're being faithful. I encourage you to get it. And then lastly, this is, still needs to be re-edited. It's one of the first books I wrote. It's uh, Learning to Minister Under the Anointing and How to Have a Healing Ministry in Your Church. Um, the second part of that, Bill Johnson, myself, and Tom Jones, who was a pastor of a large Church of God Pentecostal church in Florida, who later became my vice president and a leader uh, next to me, we all participated and shared when I'd been pastor, when he was pastor and Bill was pastor, what we did as pastors to develop an atmosphere of healing in our churches, practical things that you could do. And so, uh, and then learning how to minister under the anointing is just so, so simple of seeing what the Father's doing, how to recognize it and bless it and come in agreement with what God's doing. And that's this one. So, do I have a pastor? I want, we have the book, Biblical Guidebook to Deliverance. A pastor who has not received anything yet in this meeting, and you'd like to have this book, come and get it. Now, do I have, there you go, you're welcome. Do I have someone who struggles with grace and you're, you're very hard on yourself? And you probably judge yourself very, very strongly. There's so many of you. And now, the ones that don't get it will need inner healing. For <laughs> But I think you were the first one with your hand up. So the first one, that's... Uh... And for the others, I, I really encourage you. I think it would be a great blessing to you. You're welcome. Uh, uh, learning to minister under the anointing, the healing ministry in your church. I'd like for that go to a pastor do, that, is not, that hasn't received anything yet. Is, is there a pastor here that says, hey, I need that? Um, okay. And then healing out of intimacy and acts of obedience. I'd like to, do we have an elder here? You're an elder of a church. You know, if you're an elder, you should have really hunger because out of your very role as an elder, any, if any among you are sick, let him call for the elders. By the way, you an elder? There you go. You're welcome. And by the way, let me give you my spin on that. I do not think, as some churches teach, that means only the elders should pray for the sick in the church. And so when the sick come up, it's the elders only that get to pray. There's, there's several reasons for that. If you look at the qualifications for an elder, they're very strong. They're, you know, elder and deacon. And there's a lot of people 
that, that don't meet the qualifications to be an elder. They don't understand the scriptures that well. They, they, they may not be that mature in the Lord, but they have a gift of healing that's pure grace, not based upon your knowledge of the word or how mature you are. It is a, it is a gift. And, and sometimes it happens to, very, to people who it's, you know, it's kind of like they're not very old in the Lord and they don't have their act together yet. <laughs> but the God has given them a gift. And so they could be on the ministry team because they have a gift, but they shouldn't be an elder. But all elders should be able to be on the ministry team. And, and so, uh, but we don't want to limit it only to elders, but here's, here's why. I don't think it's even talking about the church gathered. I think it's talking about the church gathered, scattered. If you are sick, if any of you are sick, then call the elders. If you're sick, you can't, you know, you could be sick. You can't even get to the meeting. By the way, they didn't have meetings like this. It was rare. They met in, 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 in houses. Um, and, and so the calling for the elders is, is to possibly come to you, to pray for you. Not Because and, and I've been in, in, in some, I asked, do, do you, does people in your church get to pray for sick? They said, no, only the elders. And this is the basis, James 5. And I think that's a, a, a misreading of, of James 5. Um, but anyway, that's my opinion. So having said that, I'm now out of books. I want to get ready started with the, the message. Let's pray. Father, we pray that you give us hunger and you give us expectant faith. And we pray that that hunger, that desperation, and that faith would draw on your anointing. In the name of Jesus, we ask God that what we've seen you do all over the world, faithfully, every time, we ask you to do again. And Lord, I kind of feel like Jesus praying outside the tomb of Lazarus. I prayed that not for, I prayed it for their sake to hear. Because I know what you've said you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. In Matthew chapter 11 and verse 12, it says that... From the days of John the Baptist and now the kingdom of God has been advancing forcefully and forceful people, and King James says violent people, take it by force. Or, so I just believe that this is not something that's, that uh, is for the passive. Uh, it's not something, I don't think it's a super spiritual. I think it's actually, um, it, it's a turn off to me when I ask people, what do you want? Oh, whatever God wants to give me. I just know that you're not hungry for anything. Because if God's given you divine hunger for something, you will know what it is and be asking for it. And so, that's, uh, and so I believe that, that the, as it says in 2 Chronicles 16, 9, the eyes of God roam to and fro across the earth looking for someone through whom he can show himself strong. Isn't that amazing? That God is actually looking for people through whom he can show himself strong. And one of the interesting and encouraging things about that is once... Um, when Toronto, after Toronto had happened, the uh, a pastor of a large Pentecostal church in Canada, Toronto, Canada, called the pastor of the largest Pentecostal church in St. Louis, where I live, and said, do you know Randy Clark? He says, yes, I know Randy Clark. He said, well, he's up here, and God's using him to break, it's a real revival's broken out. He said, well, it can't be the Randy Clark I know. <laughs> I mean, this guy told me this himself later. He said, well, it says his name is Randy Clark. And, the, and this Pentecostal guy from St. Louis said, then there has to be two Randy Clarks living in St. Louis. It can't be the one I know. Uh, after Toronto happened, I went back about three months later to the pastor's meeting that I'd been with. And uh, with uh, uh, two or three Lutheran pastors, Southern Baptist pastor, United Church of Christ pastor. Uh, I was vineyard pastor. And uh, uh, one of the Lutheran pastors, he said to me, you know, I don't believe what's going on in Toronto is God. I knew he wasn't the only one that thought that, but I was curious as to why. And I asked him, why? He said, because you're leading it. <laughs> I know you. I've heard you pray. I can pray better than you can. <laughs> I've never heard you preach, but I bet I can preach better than you can too. So why would God choose you instead of me? And I said, because I'm more qualified. He said, no, wait a minute, I just told you I could preach better, I know the word better, and I think I can preach better than you can. So how can you be more qualified than me? I said, because you forgot that 
The Apostle Paul told us that God has chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the strong <laughs> and the weak things, the wise. I'm just more foolish and weaker than you are. <laughs> the point I wanted to make was sometimes who we think is the person God can see that he can use to show himself strong. In, in the scripture, we need to remember that David was the shortest and weakest and the one that they didn't even think was qualified, didn't even bring him to the meeting. <laughs> All the other brothers came. We have to remember that that uh, my mind just went blank. Smallest guy. The, um, no, 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 no. Three, the three hundred. You know, you all know this. The three hundred. Gideon. See, my mind went blank. I'm having a sixty-five moment right there. <laughs> that Gideon. He was he was hiding out in the wine press, and he was the smallest of. His, he was the runt of the bunch. You know, you had that word runt. You know what a runt is? It's the smallest of the litter of pigs. And uh, he was little, and he's among the smallest crowd. Why? Because God wanted to make sure that when he gave the victory, people wouldn't think it was because of the greatness of the man, that they'd know it was because of the greatness of the God behind, the weak person. When God came to my church, the person he touched as one of the, and gave the greatest gift of word of knowledge and discerning of spirits to and healing was one of my worst Christians. He really was. He'd been on my board for seven years, but he had only gotten saved the night before. <laughs> and he admitted that he had had a false conversion. It takes humility to do that. And uh, he wasn't liked very well because he was egotistical and proud, and God humbled him. I'll tell you about him again at the end of the sermon. So when we look to... Uh, Hebrews chapter 6, because in this sermon, I'm going to do two things. Number one, I'm going to try to lay a biblical foundation for the actual doctrine of laying on of hands or impartation. Um, because there are teachings, whole teachings, there are even some denominations that have a position paper against what I'm going to teach today. And so I want you, I'm aware of that, so I want you just to approach this as a Berean. Let us study the word to see if these things may be so. And that's why if you're concerned that this may not be proper or biblical, you won't want to yield yourself to experience what you have questions about. And so I believe that rather than denominational positions, we just need to look at the word. And, and then secondly, even if I lay the foundation in the word... You could be, some of you could be taught from a tradition. God used to do that, but he doesn't do that anymore. And so the stories of what I've seen him do, I trust your ability to discern if the fruit that happened in these people's lives, if this was not God, then it's, it, it definitely couldn't be a human ability because it goes way past the human ability. you only left with two options. It's either God or it's the enemy. And I trust your ability to discern based upon the fruit and end up with the conclusion, God has really been doing this and he's still doing it today. It's only when we remove the fear and there are fear mongers and we need to remove the fear of this teaching. So I want to start out by dealing with the biblical side and then the stories. My only problem is I, 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 I have stories that sneak in when I don't even want them. You know, they just sneak in on me. So let's look at Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. In Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1 and 2, it's, it's the, what I call the alpha course of the first century church. You know, it's, it's saying these are the foundational teachings. And so it's, it's, a, it's a, amazing to me that I could have gone through four years of theological training and in three, in, at college level and then three more years and never hear one teaching about these elementary teachings. Now, other schools you could have, but not where I went. Found elementary or found, is more in a sense of foundational. 
When you built this building out here, this new church building that you're building, there's a lot of money went in before you ever saw anything above the ground. There's a lot of money going into the work of building that foundation and getting it right because of the foundations off, everything's off. And so foundational is more important than the, what we call the deep things of God. No, it's the foundational, it's the basic things of God that we must uh, really make sure that we've got them down pat. And so the writer of Hebrews starts out in uh, Hebrews 6, verse 1 and 2. Therefore, let us leave the elementary teachings about Christ and go on to maturity. But then what he says next is he actually lists the elementary teachings. So he says, let us go on to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death. You can't get any more foundational than you need to repent. And the faith in God. How can, what foundational. Instruction about baptisms. No, it's a plural, not a singular. It doesn't say instruction about baptism. Instruction about baptisms. There are three baptisms in the New Testament. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For by one spirit we've all been baptized into Christ. Whether the Jew or Greek, bond or free. And we've all been given the same spirit to drink. That's conversion. The spirit puts us in Christ. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. We are born of the Spirit. And so it's, it's, it's this baptism of the Spirit that puts us into Christ. He does the work. Then there's water baptism. And there is the baptism in the Spirit. Now the difference between the first baptism and the third baptism I've talked about is the first baptism is regeneration. But the third baptism is the the, the the person of the Trinity that does it is not the Holy Spirit who puts us into Christ. It is now Jesus. He is the baptizer with the Holy Spirit. He baptizes us into or with the Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit is the one who instigates the action of the first baptism, but Jesus is the one who instigates the action of the, second, of the third baptism. And it's very important. It's one of the it's, it's the number three of the six. But number four, and by the way, we, what we're talking about today, these can be to happen simultaneously. Number four is the doctrine, or it, it talks about um, the, the laying on of hands. Now, number two, it says instruction. Sometimes say the doctrine of baptisms. Then it says the laying on of hands. What is laying on of hands? Laying on of hands was broader than impartation. Laying on of hands. You shall lay your hands on the sick and they shall recover. You lay your hands on the sick and they shall be healed. And so laying on of hands was connected to healing. Um, laying on of hands was connected to blessing. They asked Jesus to bless the children and often it was through the laying on of hands. Laying on of hands was for identification in Leviticus chapter 16 on the day of Yom Kippur, the day of atonement. The high priest laid his hands on the two goats, one for justification, one for typology of sanctification. And where the people's sins were placed upon him. When John the Baptist baptized Jesus, it was his identifying with the sins of the world, taking upon himself. Uh, it was what Hebrew, I, I mean, Isaiah 53 talks about. He bore in his body not only our sickness and our diseases, but it also talks about, and by his stripes we were healed, but it also talks about he bore in his body our sins and our trespasses. And so there was this laying on of hands, identification, I'm taking upon me the sins uh, of the world. So identification, blessing, healing. But the laying on of hands was also for activation of gifts and for people to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Now, if I taught that the way that you're baptized in the Holy Spirit is hands has to be laid on you, that would be in error. Because the scriptures do not teach that hands must be laid upon someone to be baptized in the Spirit. Uh, uh, in Acts 2, no hands are laid on. In Acts 4, no hands are laid on. In Acts um, Eight, there is the laying on of hands. In Acts 9, there is the laying on of hands. In Acts 10, there is no laying on of hands. In Acts 19, there is the laying on of hands. Half of the time, 
hands were laid on when people were filled with the Holy Spirit. But half of the time, there was no hands laid on. What I'm saying is, this is one of the two ways in scriptures that people were, were baptized in the Holy Spirit. I do not think I have to lay my hands on anybody from the God. I know God can do it. And, and some of the times, in meetings like this, I've actually had the guy tell me, I couldn't even get up to you. He knocked me down clear on the back row and I couldn't get up. But by the time it was over, it was over. God had already done it to me. Nobody had to lay hands on me. And then other times in the same meeting, there was, when the hands were laid on, there was something happened just then. And it's not like someone would think. And, and please don't think it's, it's kind of like uh, magical. It's, you know, I've got, I, I can make this happen. I can't. Uh, people come to me all the time that's read some of my books and they catch me and say, would you lay hands on me and pray for me? I say, I, I will, but it doesn't work like that. It's not because I lay my hands on you. It's what has happened is when we're teaching, we're exalting Christ, where he's the baptizer, and we're teaching the word, and we're giving stories and illustration of what he's done, it creates hunger. It creates faith. It, it draws on, I believe it even it draws the angelic into the meeting. It, 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 there, it, it's, it's a God thing. It's a sovereign thing. So I just know that in meetings like this, God is going to have arranged for some of you to be here for just such a thing. And I, and I don't expect, I expect everybody that's here today to be strengthened. But I do not expect everybody to be touched in the same way. Let me illustrate that. I was in Charlotte, North Carolina. And uh, I was in the basement of a Lutheran church. We have 400 pastors there. And uh, I'm, I'm teaching on this subject. And Mahesh Shabda's wife, Bonnie, is a prophetess. And a seer. And uh, she had fallen under the power. And as I'm uh, walking around, she motions for me to come over where she says she's lying on the floor. And she says, do you want me to tell you what I see? Well, I'm not a seer, so I'm always intrigued with those who are seers. And I said, yes, what do you see? She said, when you began to pray, hundreds of angels came in this room. Six feet tall. I, I'm six feet tall. Or I was. I'm getting shorter. <laughs> um, <laughs> And they, and whether, you know, whether or not she's seeing a vision to understand what God's doing or this is literally what was happening, I'll let you interpret for yourself. It doesn't make me any difference because <laughs> I don't really know how to interpret it myself. I'm just telling you what she told me. And they had a bag. And in the bag was like this anointing. And they would come up to people and they would take the anointing and they would put it into the people, strengthening them. Now, I believe it's God's intention. He wants everybody to be strengthened today. Whether he does it sovereignly apart from the angelic or he has some help. Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to help those of us who have eternal life? He makes his angels winds, his servants flames of fire. Uh, that's just another whole message. But anyway, um, <laughs> and then she said, but then, and there were hundreds of them. But then later I saw three. Angels come in the room. They were nine feet tall. Wow. And they didn't have a bag. And they weren't coming to strengthen. They came with a scroll. They went to just a few people out of the 400 that was there. Most all the stories I tell you today are stories that got the commissioning. They came to commission. And they went to the people and they stood right in front of them and they unrolled the scroll and they declared into the spirit realm what was written on that scroll. And then they took out a stamp and stamped their foreheads. They came for a different purpose. They came to commission. One of the reasons why I've been willing to leave my family and be gone half or more, two-thirds sometimes of a year is I, it's not to teach there's so many, like the Lutheran guy was right. There's so many preachers that can preach better than me, teachers that can teach better than me. But what excites me is to know that by the sovereign grace of God, when I met John Wimber the first time, when I had a church of 150 people in a little village as a Baptist and knew nothing, John heard the 
voice of God audibly. He only had that happen three times in his life, two times with me. He heard the first time and the second time I met him. He heard the voice of God say, this man I'm going to send around the world one day and I'm going to use him to lay hands on pastors and leaders to stir up the gifts of the Spirit and for him to be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's a, you have to understand, John didn't, John didn't believe in apostles. But he told me, you have an apostolic call. It's always confusing. I can be the adjective, but not the noun. <laughs> you know? My faith is in that word. Not in my performance. Not in my ability. Except I want to be a f- faithful in stewarding. And, and trying to... I want to be the donkey that Jesus rides into the church on. I, 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 I don't want to touch his glory. And so I really do want you to know that even though that God has said, I want to use you in this way, it's not necessary today. God is not going to be limited by the numbers of people I can reach. And by the way, I purposely prayed for in our school, lay hands because I know that you know, they're going to be with us and they go to nations with us, that that anointing on my life they're going to be helping today, even as you see this doctrine of impartation, the first place, you know, the teaching about first, what's the word? First, first appearance is, is a way of understanding things. The first time in, you see this in the scripture is Numbers eleven seventeen. God spoke to Moses and he said, gather the elders together, attend a meeting, and I will come down. This is God. I will come down. And I, God, I will take of the spirit that's on you. It's, it's God's spirit on him. I'll take the spirit that's on you and I will put it on them. And they will help you carry the burden of the people. Now, what, what, interesting, when people are baptized in the spirit or filled with the spirit, almost always something of speech happens. And they prophesied. And they were given wisdom. That's what they needed to be the judges. They needed wisdom, the wisdom of God. But a sign of being filled was they prophesied. Signs of being filled, they prophesy, praise, preaching boldly, tongues, tongues and prophecy, praise. By the way, when the, when the, when the tongues that was actually in the languages of people was heard, it was, they were praising God. And so no one touched them. God did it. There's no laying out of hands in the first time it's mentioned. But the concept of anointing on one person being carried to another, this is really interesting because usually when people are very, very strong prophetically, when they lay hands on you, what activates most? Prophecy. If if their greatest strength is words of knowledge and healing, what usually is one of the strongest things you hear people talking about? Beginning to flow in words of knowledge. And healing. If someone's greatest strength is just this bold evangelist, they lay hands on you, guess what? It doesn't mean that the person, that you're limited to whatever's in the person. Here, this should be encouraging to you. All the stories I'm going to tell you about later are people that I prayed for and they got a more powerful anointing than I have. They've seen much more healings than I have seen. They've seen many more salvations than I've seen. The anointing they got when I laid hands on them and prophesied over them, it was God, but they became much more than me. I think that's so wonderful that God can use you to give to somebody what you don't have or more than what you have. And so I want you to be encouraged. Today, Now, we looked at Numbers eleven seventeen, 17, but the second one is uh, Deuteronomy 34, 9. And it says, Joshua, the son of Nun, received a spirit of wisdom because Moses laid his hands on him. So in the Old Testament, you see no laying on of hands in Numbers eleven seventeen, 17, and the laying on of hands in Deuteronomy 34, 9. One of the classic passages about transference of anointing is 2 Kings chapter 2, where Elijah came to Elijah and said, what do you want me to do for you when I'm taking up? Uh, before I'm taken up. And he said, um, I want a double portion of the anointing that's on your life. And Elijah said, you've asked for a very difficult thing, but if you're with me when I'm taken up, it'll be done to you as you have asked. And as um, 
and the chariot of fire come was kind of like a distraction. Elijah keeps his eyes on Elijah, not the chariot of fire. And as he's going up in what I believe was not Toto and Dorothy in Wizard of Oz in Kansas in a literal tornado or whirlwind, it was he makes his angels winds, his servants flames of fire. That was an angelic entourage that was taking Elijah up to heaven, Elijah. And Elijah saw it and he said, my father, my father, and his mantle fell to the ground. Now, the mantle was an actual piece of clothing that when he was coming over just a short time before, coming across the River Jordan, it was, it was in the, like a flood stage, and he took that mantle and he smote it and the river parted and they walked by on dry land. And so this is the very piece of clothing that's now fallen to the ground. Now, this is one of the things I, this is a great example for you. Please don't leave here and start bragging. I got Randy Clark's anointing. There's too many people going around. I got Mariah Woodworth Smith's anointing. I got Catherine Kuhlman's anointing. I got Benny Hinn's anointing. I got John Wimber's anointing. I got so-and-so's anointing. I got so... Nah. Do what Elisha did. He didn't grab that, look at the other prophets, put it around his neck and say, I got Elijah's mantle. I got Elijah's mantle. I got Elijah's mantle. <laughs> you didn't get it. I did. <laughs> Perhaps he was such a good student of the Old Testament. He, re he remembered the story of Joseph bragging <laughs> about what was going to happen one day and ending up in the pit and then in prison. So he didn't go there. Instead, he did something smart. He wanted to find out if he really did get anything. And he walked over to the same river Jordan. He said, where now is the Lord God of Elijah? And then he smote the river and it parted. And all the other prophets saw it. And they said, surely the Lord God that was with Elijah is now with Elisha. Here's the wonderful thing. He was the student. Elijah was the mentor. He's the mentor. He ain't. But he said, I want double what you got. And if you study it out, he actually did have twice the number of miracles that his spiritual father had. My desire is like all these others, I will hear down the road, please don't make me wait two to six years, which is usually what the record is, and I don't hear about it for years, but I'll hear of someone in this meeting, they got such an anointing that they became a history maker, literally, and their names are now written in church history books of what God is doing. Because it doesn't take a big crowd. Sometimes I've been in meetings as little as 50 people. And one of those 50 was one of the persons that I'll talk about when we get to the stories who became a history maker, led over a million people uh, to the Lord. So we're not going to look at verse uh, number five and number six, which is uh, the resurrection of the dead and then eternal judgment. But three and four, doctrine of baptism, one folks, baptism of the spirit, and number four, the laying on of hands, which can be some, and by the way, there can be more than one filling of the spirit. People in Acts 2, they were filled with the spirit, but they were filled again in Acts chapter 4. So you can, you, you can see multiple, multiple fillings uh, in the scripture uh, itself. Now, when we look at the New Testament, uh, I've already talked about the difference between what happened in Acts 2 and Acts 4. One had tongues, one didn't have tongues. Acts uh, 8, uh, there was no mention of tongues, but something so visible, you didn't have to just... See, here's the way uh, Gordon Fee, a New Testament Assemblies of God scholar, said in his book, in God's Empowering Presence, that the most important doctrine of the Apostle Paul was not justification by faith. That's the second most important. The most important was the reality of that justification of faith is verified through the experience of the Spirit. That the experience of the Spirit is the basis of knowing we have salvation. And so we were saved by faith, yes. But when Paul said, did you receive the Spirit through the works of the law or by faith, that question demands that that is an experience you can know you have received the Spirit. 
faith is the, the way we receive, but having received, once faith has laid hold of it, it's reality. No one, no one is going to have to tell you you have the Holy Spirit. Now, having said that, Bill Johnson surprised me one day doing an interview with me. He can't tell me when he was saved. He grew up in a Christian home. He just always remembers believing in Jesus and following. He can't, I can't, I can't, I grew up in a Christian home too, but I can tell you the, 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 the Sunday before my 16th birthday, I can tell you what the sermon is about, I can tell you all about it, it's as fresh today, but Bill can't. I was meeting with a pastor in, Saint, in um, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, I, I, I got one of the largest uh, charismatic church, he can't either. Same way, grew up in that. Now, he said, well, now it seems like you're contradicting. no. You may be so young that you just don't remember. But the reality is you're aware of the Holy Spirit at work in your life. It's not something you're living just totally by faith in without any evidence. There is the evidence. You may not remember the moment it happened, but you know of the moments it continues to happen. Do you know what I mean? It's powerful, it's real, it can be sweet and real, it can be, it's different for different people. Sometimes people are just overwhelmed with tears. And, oh, uh, this was seen by the history of the church, it has more history behind it than any other sign of being filled with the Holy Spirit. It's called Holy Tears. And throughout the history of the church, and even today, and some of the stories I'm going to tell you, it was this baptism of tears because it was a baptism of love. The baptism of the Spirit can be powerful and loving at the same time. And some people experience more of the power and, and not, they're not so overwhelmed with the love and others more of the love. And, and, and some is just kind of like both at the same time. But sometimes we, depending on what's happening, we think, well, if I'm going to really, really be baptized in the Spirit, I need to fall down and laugh. Holy laughter. No, you don't. I had people come up to me in the last 23 years after trial and said, I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I, don't, I, 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 want, I want to feel God. I want, I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And they're sitting there right in front of me and their tears just running down their cheeks. And I said, what's this? If this doesn't count. I want to laugh. <laughs> And I said, this does count. This is just as, just as real. Holy joys, holy tears from holy love. They both count. Tongues count. Prophesying in tongues counts. Experiences of just over, uh, of elation counts. Not everybody feels like they're going to die <laughs> from the power. I know... I grew up, you know, I, I went to call to preach at 18, and I was Baptist. And I loved to read about revival. And I would read Finney. And he said, I perceive these waves of liquid love and that these waves of, of electricity would have continued to roll over my body one wave after the other, wave after wave after. I would have died. And I said, I don't know you like that, God. I mean, I felt, I felt your love. I've, I've cried I felt peace, Lord. I but this—they're talking about a literal power that they felt like they were going to die. If God, if that's possible, I'd like to have an experience like that. And then a little bit later, when I was older, a year or so older, I learned about D.L. Moody and a famous. These weren't Pentecostals. A famous uh, evangelist, and in, in, in New York City, when he'd go to raise some money from his church had burned down in Chicago fire. He's on a street and the Holy Spirit falls on him because he's been asking. He's become hungry for more of the Holy Spirit because at first he was upset when people said you need to be baptized in the Spirit. And this was in the 1800s before Pentecostalism came along. And, and, but there was still a subsequent experience of power. And he was first offended and praying high the same way, first offended and then became hungry. And he became one with great evangelist, another great missionary in India. And, and, and so... It 
Spirit of God fell on him. He runs in this house and they give him a bedroom in the back. He goes in the back and he actually says, he lifted up his hands and he said, Lord, stay your power. That means hold back your power lest you kill me. I can't stand anymore. I said, God, if that's possible, I want that. 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. Just reading about those things. Wanting to see that. And a secret thing in my heart was before I die, God, I'd love just once to be in a meeting where your power is so strong. People are afraid they're going to die. Did you ever pray that? I mean, I prayed it for myself. God, I, I, I want it to be so powerful, I think I'm going to die. That's what I, I prayed. Ten years later, I'm in a meeting where it happens to one of my parishioners. And I'm actually standing up by the pulpit about right here. And he's right here. I'll tell you about him later, but this is what he said. He's still crying like an hour later after his first touch. He's still crying. He's still got this power going through him. And he lifted up his hand. See, I'm the one that read. He didn't read anything. And, <laughs> and he did not know about these experiences. And he said, oh, God, I can't stand anymore. You're going to kill me. And I'm standing right there. And I was 32 years old. I said, yes, yes. Revival, revival. Our church is in revival. Somebody thinks they're going to die from the power. Yes, yes. I was so excited. But it would be five years later before I would be laying in the floor of a regional vineyard meeting, crying out, screaming. I don't mean, I mean, That's what I was doing. <laughs> it was not a pretty sight. I was in a fetal position. I was knocked down. Now, there's other times I just quit resisting. You know, you can, there, there can be a point that you can actually resist the Holy Spirit. He comes on you. I've watched people. I pray for them. They say they can't receive. They can receive. They receive right now. They're just resisting. And he said, what do you mean? I said, well, watch them. You start praying. You see this. After a while, I said, you know, you're resisting God. Let me show you what you're doing. I thought I was a hard to receive because I thought you were supposed to stand up as long as you could until the 10-foot angel with the baseball bat <laughs> clipped you to knees. And I was complaining. I said, I, I, I'm the only one of two pastors out of hundreds. So everybody's down on the floor. And I'm standing up. So one time, my friend in my church, I said, do you feel anything with people? I said, sure I do. He said, what do you feel? I said, I feel this pressure. It comes from behind almost all the time. pushes me forward like this. And he said, what do you do? I curl my toes and I tighten up everything <laughs> and I try everything I can to keep standing. He says, no, Randy, you're not hard to receive. You just don't know how to receive. And I'll never forget, this really helped me. He said, the next time you're prayed for, don't fake a fall because that'd be the flesh. But don't try to stop it either. Just be a sail in the wind. Don't try to stop it and don't try to fake it. And I found out I wasn't hard to receive at all. Because the next time I got prayed for, I ended up on the floor because I didn't stop it. I, because I thought you were supposed to try to, you know, stand up as long as you can till it knocks you down. By the way, he can knock you down too. Because the, the one I'm telling you about, I'm screaming, I'm sweating. My hands are contorted like this, my arms, and, and, and my face is, is electrocuted, not just electricity all over my lips and stuff. And I'm thinking on the floor, that this is getting, you know, this, is, this doesn't feel good. This hurts. And the longer it went, the more it started hurting, the stronger it got. It just got more and more until one point I actually remember thinking, God, I don't think you want to kill me, but you are scaring me. Are you aware of, of how weak my body is? God, if you turn up the power anymore, I, I think you'll kill me. And I don't think you want to, but you are scaring me. And I realized right in the moment, this is what you asked for. 
This is what you asked for. Now, I don't want you to get the wrong opinion. I've been in ministry 47 years. I've had one of those experiences. One. I saw my executive director at the time, Tom Jones, the Cleveland Pentecostal. He'd spoken in tongues as a kid. He's a pastor of a Pentecostal denomination, one of the earliest and oldest Pentecostal denominations in the United States. But I saw him fall in a, a four-square church in Curitiba, Brazil. And after he got up, his ring finger's doing this. And, he, and he's walking by me, and I see that. And I said, hey, Tom, what you doing? <laughs> What's going on? He said, Randy, it's the weirdest thing. It's like this finger's got a mind of its own. I'm trying to keep it down, and it won't stay down. And I don't know why I said this. I said, Tom, Tom, stop quenching the Holy Spirit. I don't know why I said that, but I did. And I said, let's pray again. And we prayed again. This time, the first time, it was like he didn't stop the, the pressure. He could have. This time he couldn't have. It's like somebody hit him and knocked him in the floor. And it was about 6 o'clock at night. It wouldn't end till after 6 in the morning. Wow. And he was on the floor in a fetal position, crying out, sweating profusely. His members of his church were fanning him with their coats. He was just sweating. His uh, chiropractor was there. His feet are up in the air. And he's, he's, he's saying, my toes were curled in my shoes. And his, my, his legs are up in the air for 45 minutes. Try doing a 45-minute leg lift. His carpet, he can't do that. I know his body. He can't do that. <laughs> Finally, uh, around 11 o'clock, he gets up five hours later, makes it upstairs, prays for a few people, and we go out and get on the bus. He sat down beside me. He made a mistake. He said, Randy, I've stopped shaking on the outside, but I can still feel the shaking on the inside. I said, really? <laughs> More! <laughs> and we had to carry him off the bus. And we took him into the hotel room, threw him on the floor, and experimented on him. <laughs> no, seriously. I want to learn about the things of the Holy Spirit. And I just, I, I, I said, hey, come on, come on. It was his church members, really. I said, let's all surround him. Let's pray in tongues over him. Let's see if it gets more powerful. <laughs> and we tried that. And, and I said, I wanted to see if, if I could lay down beside him and put my hand in his, if it, and that didn't work either. It, it, it didn't happen. And so we're, they're praying. And we, you know, we, we, I said, pray louder in tongues. And we just, you know, just, it's now in the mid-morning, like four or so. And then at around seven, I had to preach at eight, around six, I guess. I had to preach at eight in the first service. And I thought, guys, I got to preach. I'm going to go get some, try to get two hours sleep before I have to get up. And as I'm leaving the room, I walk through this just electrical place. I turned around and said, guys, there's something there. I fell and I walked through it. I don't like electricity, but I got to go to bed. Now, if I would have known what that really was, I wouldn't have gone to bed. I would have gone without sleep all night because a few years later, I found out that the men and women in his church, including Mike and Dina Van Holtz in the Father of Lights video, they were there with us. They, weren't, they hadn't gone to China yet. They started going through the room and they found this place. You could feel the electricity. And they'd pull their hands out and they'd be covered with gold dust or oil. Wipe them off. Put them back in. Bring them out. Same thing. I believe it's actually an, an angelic being. Personally, it's my opinion. It was, it was, it, anyway, it was, it was a God thing. The fruit was, Tom's wife said, I got a new husband. He's already a great husband, but he, he's even better now. 
Tom would tell you he doesn't think that he could be in the role he's in right now if it hadn't been for that experience. And one of the things I want to tell you what I said to Tom on it, I, hopefully that, I, I hope some of you will need this after a while. I can tell Tom's not liking this because Tom is very introverted, doesn't like to draw attention to himself. He'd rather just go over in a corner and cry, you know. I, want, I knelt down beside Tom and I whispered in his ear. I said, Tom, this is God. Try to enjoy it. <laughs> because this does not happen very often. It's never happened to Tom since. And it's been almost 20 years. It really is precious, golden experience. And the problem is, when it starts happening, it can be so frightening that we can't really fully appreciate all that God is doing. So after I went and Rodney prayed for me and I went home and all heaven broke loose in my church and in the regional meeting of the vineyard and then I was invited to go to Toronto. Two weeks before going to Toronto, I go to Florida where Rodney Howard Brown's at, a Pentecostal. And I got called up in the front and he prayed for me and I hit the floor and I realized I don't feel anything. I could get up right now. I mean, like there's not even a, a weight of glory on me. And I remember thinking, because I know I'm going to go to Toronto in two weeks. And I know the reason they've invited me there. They're hoping the same thing will happen and happen at the regional meeting of the vineyard. And I'm scared it won't. I'm scared it won't happen. So much so I will drive from St. Louis all the way to um, Lakeland, Florida, where Rodney's at. And I'm lying there, and I remember reading this book by um, Phillips. It's called Your God is Too Small. And one of the teachings, if I remembered it correctly, was uh, the cosmic bellhop. Sometimes we want to make God a cosmic bellhop. Like we say our prayer, and it's like, <laughs> come wait on me. Come serve me. Come, come do this or that. And God's not a cosmic bellhop. And I remember thinking that on the floor. And then I said, God, I don't feel anything right now. But I am lying here. And I'm going to stay here until either you come and touch me or the janitor makes me get up so he can vacuum when I want to close the building down. Because you're not a cosmic bellhop. But I'm so hungry. I'm so desperate for you to touch me. I'm waiting. And it wasn't long before my shoulders started landing like this, starts hurting. And I lift my arm up and bam, and it's ice cold. And I realize my hand is freezing. And, I'm, and I'm, they begin to be touched and they begin to go like this. And Rodney saw it and he came down and he put his hand in mine. There's about several thousand people there. And he said to the people, this is the fire of God in this young man's hand. And he said, now go home and pray for everybody in your church. I did, and 90% of them were powerfully, powerfully touched. But you see, I still struggled with whether or not God would use me. It's kind of like this. Power is like dynamite. Faith is the dynamite cap. If you don't have a cap on the dynamite, it doesn't explode the way it's supposed to. So I knew that I had received power, but I also knew that faith, I didn't have a very strong faith at all. People would ask me, what do you think is going to happen when you go to Toronto? And all I'd say is, I hope God shows up. My own oldest son at 12 years old said, Dad, you don't have any faith. I said, I know it. But here's why I so much believe in God. 10 o'clock on January the 19th, I'm going to fly to Toronto on the 20th. At 10 o'clock, I receive a telephone call from a Texas businessman. And he says, Randy, I just got the second most clear word I've ever had for you. And I've known this guy for 10 years. And God had used him in my life three different times. He would tell him exactly the amount of money I needed for what I was going to be doing, either for personal or for church. 
I knew his time, and, and he had had some prophecy. He had told me that you're going to speak to hundreds of thousands of people. You're going to lead a great revival. And I thought he was crazy because when he told me those things, I was trying to gather a church of 100. He said, you're going to speak to 100,000. I said to my wife, I didn't have 50 people. I said, I'd like to preach to 100. <laughs> I, 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 I actually threw those prophecies. He sent them to me, and I threw them away. I just threw them in a waste can. I said, he's crazy. He's crazy. He keeps telling me I'm going to lead a great revival. He keeps seeing these visions and dreams. I, I, I don't think that's God. It's impossible. I could not go where he was at. But because of his timing about money, and I, he did not know I was going to Toronto the next day, he called me and said, second most powerful word I've ever had for you. I said, what is it, Richard? He says, the Lord says, test me now. Test me now. Test me now. Do not be afraid. I will back you up. I want your eyes to be open to see my resources for you in the heavenlies. Even as Elijah prayed, Gehazi's eyes would be open. And do not become anxious because when you become anxious, you can't hear me. That word changed my life. That word put the cap on the dynamite. That word, I knew this is God. He did not know I was going to Toronto the next day. He didn't know I was even going to Toronto, period. This is God. And so instead of saying, I hope God shows up, the next morning when I got with a team that was going with me, five other people, I said, we're going on an apostolic mission trip and we're going to see more than we've ever seen in our lifetime. And there were times over the next few weeks that I would say things and then get, think, why did I say that? Oh my gosh, that's so risky. But God would come and back it up. In the New Testament, in, Acts chapter, in, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 14, he says, Do not neglect the gift of God that's within you through a prophetic message when the body of elders laid their hands on you. It's a gift of God he's talking about. Not the baptism of the Spirit, not the Holy Spirit. A gift of God that had been given through a prophecy and the laying on of hands. In 2 Timothy 1, 6, he said, fan in the flame the gift of God that's within you through the laying on of my hands. So there's the scriptures that teach that gifts can be imparted. Ananias was not an apostle to fear that this opens it up to the restoration of the apostles, which I don't fear that, but if, even if that is the case, Ananias was just a disciple. He was not an apostle and yet he laid his hands on Paul that he'd be healed and that he'd prophesy. That he would be healed and receive the Spirit. And he was not an apostle. I think it's interesting. Sometimes God wants to Make sure no one else gets the credit. He chooses just some unknown disciple to say the right thing in the right moment that catapults somebody into their ministry. You say, wait, why don't you get in a more doctrinal book? You, you know the most doctrinal book of all books in the New Testament is the book of Romans? Uh, that's where Paul lays out his doctrine more than anywhere else. But in the first chapter, verse 11, he says, I wanted to come to you that I might impart some spiritual gift to you. It's biblical. Now, having laid out these biblical foundations, I want to give you some illustrations. I hope that that's enough of the scriptures that you have confidence that what I'm talking about is not unbiblical, but it is a biblical teaching in the Word of God. Now, the rest of the stories, so that you may know that God not only did it in the Bible, but God is doing it in the 21st century. And I want to tell you some stories. I want to start out with, for, for those of you who are not pastors and not uh, in full-time ministry, in 2016, when we were in 
Switzerland, there's a woman that had, in the afternoon, like this afternoon, we prayed for her and she felt power come upon her. And she's, she feels what she felt was like a tremendous heat in her body and especially in her hands. This woman had never prayed for another person in her life, ever. She not, she's too timid, too scared. She just wouldn't do it. Didn't have faith for it. That night after this impartation, she goes to meet with a new age friend that's not a Christian who has something wrong with her pelvis bone and it's fractured and it won't heal right and she's very concerned about it and the doctors can't figure out why it's not healing. It should have healed by now and it's not even started to heal and as she's talking uh, to this woman who just received this impartation, her hands gets hot and she says, will you let me pray for you? Which one thing was boldness. She had never done that before and she's the new ager, they're easy to pray for. They're a lot easier than cessationists. She said, sure. And uh, she laid her hands on the hip and she began to pray for that woman and she said it felt like fire. So much heat came across her pelvis. She went to the doctor the next day and she calls her friend who's at the meeting. Uh, worship's going on. And I see the friend. I don't know what's going on, but I see her with the cell phone and she's doubling over to waist and she's weeping. And I thought, oh my, somebody must have died or something. But what's really happening is her friend's on the other side from the doctor's office. And this is what she's saying. I came into the doctor's office. They took an x-ray today. The doctor looked at it and he said, this is the wrong x-ray. Because I have her other x-ray. This is impossible. This cannot be her x-ray. Somehow it must have got confused. The nurse said, no, doctor, I, it's, it's her x-ray. He said, no, I'm a man of science. This can't be right. And he made her go do another x-ray. She went and did another x-ray, brought it right in. She said, doctor, I have not let it leave my hands. This is her x-ray. He looks at it and he said, this is impossible. That is, I'm a man of science. This is impossible. That cannot be healed. Not that fast. <laughs> there has to be something wrong with the x-ray machine. Go to another x-ray machine and do it again, which she did and came back and it's the same thing. And the doctor said, what did you do? And she told about her friend coming and laying hands on her. And the doctor said, could you get your friend to come pray for me? <laughs> A man of science, totally convinced when he saw the evidence. This woman had never had a healing in her life. And within a matter of a few hours after leaving the meeting, having received an impartation for healing, which manifested in her, by the way, by the heat. Now, that's not the way it is with lots of other people, but it was in her case. I don't want us to say this means that, but I don't want us to know about the, I just want us to recognize diversity. So another woman, this is for all the women that are here. This woman's name is Karen. I don't know her last name. And Copenhagen is one of the most secular cities in Europe. And Europe is one of those secular uh, continents. And this happened uh, five years before I was told the story. We had gone there for the first time. And this woman, who was a, another introvert, she came forward for prayer. And God touched her. She wasn't, you know like hugely manifest or anything, but God touched her and she received this, this compassion. And being an introvert, she doesn't, it's hard for her to, you know, come into somebody's life. And, but she gets so bold, even though she's an introvert. God didn't turn her into an extrovert. She's still an introvert, but now she's got boldness. And she went and bought her a, 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 a tablet and she took a ruler and made four columns on it. And she would write down the people's names. And she'd meet them on the street. She could tell they needed healing. And she'd ask them what's wrong. She'd write in their name, their condition, and the day she prayed for them. And if they got healed right then, she'd, she'd write it in. But if it was later that she found out that they were healed, she'd write it in. She didn't tell me this, but the executive pastor found out about it. He said, I want you to meet this woman. Introduced me to her behind the scenes in a private room. And told me her name was Karen. And this is the story, the rest of the story. In five years, she had 1,800 confirmed healings of people she prayed for on the streets of Copenhagen. This woman had never had a healing before that. Never had the courage to even pray for anybody before that. One of the things the Holy Spirit does is he makes us bold. Before I was filled with the Holy Spirit, I'd been asked by the American Baptist denomination to go to St. Louis and start a church. They'd give me $100,000 stipend, stipend over five years. There was a church building already there that they had in 40 people waiting, and I wouldn't do it. 
because I was afraid I'd fail. But later, in less than two years later, when I'm touched by the Holy Spirit, I go to St. Louis and I start a church without $100,000, without anybody there, and no church building and fried donuts to make a living for my family to start the church. Where did that boldness come from? Where before I was afraid I'd fail, now I'm not afraid I'll fail. Is because of what happened that night. The first time I was filled with the Holy Spirit, it created boldness. So Karen, the neat thing is nobody knows about Karen. Myself, Bill Johnson, Heidi Baker, Benny Hinn, you know, Oral Roberts, a bunch of people you could name. Oh, I know who those are. Yes, I know who those are. But nobody hardly at all knows this woman's name. It's Karen. We don't know her last name. Oral Roberts and his healing tents, all the major famous people in the 1948 healing revival, the average percent of people that were healed in their healing lines was 15%. Karen has 42% of the people she's praying for that's being healed. That is much more than we see in healing meetings. And nobody knows her. Nobody on earth, earth, basically, knows who Karen is. But I believe her name is known in heaven and feared in hell because God doesn't see the things as we do. Here is a woman who has such an anointing. And she's not what we'd say in, in full-time ministry. Three years ago, a pastor from the Foursquare denomination in Brazil came. His name is Hinalji. He came to the voice of the apostles. He ended up laying in front of the platform for three days. Just, just would come up and would lay himself. And a lot of times he's knocked down too when others would pray for him. Got prayed for a lot of people. He was the son of the president of the four square denomination of the state of Sao Paulo. He had a church of several thousand members already. He believed in healing. He was a Pentecostal. He had spoken in tongues for years. But there was a new, more powerful anointing that came on his life. And within one year, he had over 100 deaf ears open. He's literally leading the youth in the revival. He, he, he has so much more boldness because he received an impartation for healing he had never had before. When I wrote the book, There Is More, I found out about a woman that I judged her because the first time I prayed for her, I felt like the Lord said, uh, uh, I walked away from her, and the Lord said, go back and pray for her again and tell her she's been sad too long. And so I went back to her, and she's on the front row, and I took my hand like this, like a pitcher, and I said, the Lord says you've been sad too long. Take another drink. And went like that, and she went drunk, just <laughs> in the Holy Spirit. Fell out of her seat, laughing, 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 and... I, I, I thought, boy, that was really exciting, and I thought it was real. But over the next 12 years, every time I would see her, she's still drunk. And I thought, I misjudged her. I thought, that started out in the spirit, but it's ended up in the flesh. Nobody can be drunk that long. I, th I, I thought, I, literally, that's what I thought. But when I wrote this book, I actually sent out an appeal. If you have a testimony, I'd like to send it to me. I'd like, I may want to include it in my book. And I got hers. And I learned what I didn't know. She was sad. Yes, I saw the countenance was sadness. She was sad, but she was sad because she had a terminal illness. And she had had a terminal illness for several years. And she's an RN and she couldn't work anymore. And uh, she had literally was in the process of, of dying. She had really bad depression. The Lord came and healed her body and healed her of her depression. And then she ended up having a ministry to Scandinavia and in one of her meetings because of healing and impartation. And we now have her come to our school sometimes and, and, and speak. Her name is Carol Berg. And, and uh, she, had, she wasn't in ministry. She, she was a dying woman. But after this happens, she's bold. She's going all over the world, especially Scandinavia. So she goes into this meeting. There's this woman that just found out she's pregnant. Not found out she's pregnant. She's found out that the pregnancy, the baby she's carrying, that's about, at the time she found out, was about eight and a half months, had died in her womb. And she was going to have to have a stillbirth. 
Carol comes into the meeting. She knows nothing about that, but sees this very pregnant lady and eight and a half months pregnant, walks over to her, puts her hands on her abdomen and says, I bless this baby in the name of Jesus. I bless your baby. And she's just speaking blessings over the baby. And two years later, she went back to the church and that two-year-old miracle boy that was raised from the dead in the womb of his mother jumped in Carol's arms. And I said, oh, God, forgive me. Because she told me later, she said, I can be fine. And I, 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 I'm not drunk all the time. It's just every time I get around you, it happens to me again. <laughs> and I realize, okay, Lord, I... <laughs> we need to be careful in our judgments because sometimes we don't know the rest of the story. But I will tell you this. If all I ever saw was the manifestations and did not hear the testimonies, I would get discouraged. It's not what I see God do to people that causes me to be so excited. It's when I hear what God did with the people that he touched that causes me to be so excited. And I'm willing to put up with stuff I don't understand. And by the way, I'll just be honest with you. I'm actually a mild-mannered person. And I, I, I get uncomfortable when it gets too crazy. And I've actually had to walk out of meetings that sometimes because these are so weird and crazy that I actually said, Lord, am I the only normal one here? You know, it was... Uh, and I don't have hardly any manifestation except for those three times I, I told you about. Most of the time it's just peace, love, tears, peace, tears, you know, most of the time. I feel sorry for the people who pray for me because they have no manifestations most of the time. Just That's it. But what I love is when I hear the rest of the story. I prayed for a man. He's a Baptist. Do we have any Baptists here? Are you American Baptist? Are you the guy I've been talking to on the internet? Okay, good. We have to talk. Anyway, so uh, this guy, he was a Baptist. And he was a charismatic Baptist. And he already spoke in tongues. And he came to the four square meeting where I'm doing a healing meeting. And he said, what can Randy talk about for three days on healing? It's either God's sovereign will to heal or it's not. That's all it is. It's that simple. Either it is or it's not. How can he speak for three days? And he came to the meeting, and in uh, the first night, he's brought his deacons with him, some of his deacons. And he doesn't like the meeting because the uh, Pentecostals in Brazil can be, really be pretty liberated in their worship, and, uh, uh, to put it mildly. And uh, it, it, it's amazing. I, I just love it, actually. But anyway, he, he said, why do they have to be so loud? And, and why do they have to be so emotional? Why can't they just be still and know that God is God? You know, that's what he was saying. And he said, and I really don't like this shaking stuff. And I've got all these leaders of my church here and the, this, the shaking going on. Why do they have to shake? As he's judging this and not liking it, his right leg <laughs> begins to shake. And he's, oh no. And he grabs his leg. His whole body starts shaking. He falls out. The deacons have to drive him home because he can't keep his foot on the gas pedal. And they drive him home that night. He gets up and he comes back in the next day. And the next night, he gets zapped by the Holy Spirit again. And he's out. He's out, out. And the deacons have to carry him to the car, to the back seat. They have to carry him out of the back seat, carry him into his home, into his bedroom, and put him in bed. This guy was already a charismatic Baptist. He already spoke in tongues. If you ask him, he said, I'd already been filled with the Holy Spirit and, um, but what happens this time is different. He's weeping. He's got holy tears. You can read it back from the early centuries through the middle ages through the whole time. This is not something new. It's something that's happened all throughout the history of the church. He's got these holy tears and all he can do is weep for three days and nights. He doesn't get out of bed. He doesn't eat, doesn't drink, and then it lifted. The man had never had a word of knowledge. He believed in gifts, but he never been used in them. He goes down to the bakery, gets a word of knowledge, knows what it is for the teaching, 
looks for who he thinks it is. He walks up to the woman he thinks this. Do your right? Does your right shoulder? Yes. How do you know that? He said, Well, I just had this word of knowledge. God speaks to me sometimes. And can I pray for you? And anyway, he was a good student. He, everything I taught, he practiced, put it into practice. And he prays for her. She gets healed. Goes to the butcher. Gets a word of knowledge for the butcher. And he gets healed. In less than two years, he had seen over 130 blind eyes and 120 deaf ears and over 50 people walk out of wheelchairs. And I, I, and I forgot uh, all the other things, but it's, it's a lot. Then we had another meeting. He's standing, his name is Marcella Casagaranji. And he's standing there and he would come to our meetings all over Brazil over the next two years. He just kept coming. I did the same thing with Wimber. I just kept going to him and Blaine's meetings. And I've, you know, I've been to a lot of other meetings. Anyway, his hands are full of liquid. I've only seen this three or four times. One time was years ago, Jack Taylor and I and Bob Bradbury from Rhode Island or Connecticut. And there, there's there's a Nazareth and uh, Bethlehem, uh, I think it is. Anyway, he was... A sh- he was uh, in Long Island, and he, Rhode Island, yeah, Rhode Island, and he was a, a captain, you know, on the, uh, out on the ocean, and, and, and Bob was with us, and, and we were in Vermont, and there's this 10-year-old girl, and she had that oil in her hands, and we took her to all the pastors, and she just anointed them until she'd run out of oil, and she'd go back, we'd pray for her some more, and more oil to come, she'd go and pray for them, and we heard the next day, those pastors she laid hands on had a breakthrough in healing. And so I'd seen this uh, two or three times. And so I asked, and also made a mistake seeing it when it really was a natural phenomenon. They, they have a overactive sweat glands in the hands, and I don't want to make a mistake. So that's my first question. Marcella, do you have overactive sweat glands? And he said, no, because I don't want to say this is, going to, this is a sign of miracles when it's nothing more than an overactive sweat gland. I want to rule that out. He has his eyes closed. He says, no, I don't. I said, open your eyes and look at your hands. And his hands literally were puddled up with liquid. And he said, uh, he looked at it, and I said over the PA, hey, everybody, this man right here, right now, is receiving a miracle anointing. God knocked him down. He's shaking. He's crying. He's burning up. My assistant, my interpreter, my spiritual son in Brazil, Ed Hosha, uh, he took his watch off and put it on his wrist, on uh, Marcella's wrist, and he prophesied to him, it's time. God is going to send you to every nation in Latin America. He didn't even own a passport, but before one year was over, that man had ministered in every nation in Latin America. The last time I saw him was just a few months ago. I said, Marcella, catch me up. What's happened? He said, Randy, I don't know because when I reached 500 blind eyes open, God said, quit counting. 500 deaf ears open, quit counting. 500 tumors disappear, quit counting. And when I had 500 people walk out of wheelchairs or throw their crutches away, God said, quit counting. I don't know. All I know is it's over 500. That's so much more than I've ever seen. That's so much more, so, so much more than what I've seen. But I got to pray for him. I got to see what God did. It's hearing the testimony. I was in Haugesund, Norway. I'm praying for what's E-free, evangelical free denomination. I was working with uh, my translators uh, from them. And there's this other guy. He's a Baptist too. And his name is Leif Hetland. And uh, uh, he had about 200 people, 250 people in this church. And this one time I got these pastors all by themselves and there's about 50 of them. I'm going down the line and I'm praying. And I get to Leif. And I said, I see you in this dark place. All around you is darkness. And God says, he's going to make you light in the darkness. And I see a multitude of people. This is like a mental picture in my head. I see a multitude of people coming out of the darkness, following you in the light. The power of God knocked him in the floor and he shook for two and a half to three hours. 
He got up. He had never had a word of knowledge, never had prophetic gifting, but he'd walked by people, know what they were feeling. He said, I felt like I was losing my mind. It's like for a week, just every person I prayed for got healed. I, I would get prophetic words. I, I, I didn't always give them, but I, I was getting stuff for people. I never had that happen before in my life. He doesn't know what to do with it. And during that year, he got his neck broken in an accident, got his back broken in an accident, from which this man who has great miracles still lives in pain every day from one of those accidents. Then as he's recuperating in traction, he remembers this prophecy, he's thinking about it, and he realizes, I need to go to a nation where they have not heard the gospel very much. And he, he went to Pakistan. And he'd been going there for, I don't know, maybe 18, 19 years now, something like that. He's led over a million Pakistani Muslims to Jesus Christ through his healing celebrations. The man who had never seen a healing because of an impartation was given a nation-changing ministry. Heidi Baker, I was in um, Canada, in Toronto, she, I was preaching a message like this. She came forward, and I saw her to the altar, and I, I said, Heidi, God wants to know. She's crying. God wants to know, do you want the nation of Mozambique? All I know is she's a burned-out missionary. She wasn't famous. Nobody knew who she was. She was hidden. Almost all of us were hidden for years before God in a suddenly changed it. We were all like you. Seriously. If you have a church over 150 people, then you're had more than I had when God first touched me. I was an unlikely choice. Didn't have a great church, thousands. Didn't even have a great church of hundreds. 150 on a good Easter Sunday and counting the dogs. <laughs> I want you to appreciate how the suddenlies can come Amen. and change your life. So, Heidi, I know she's burned out. I, I know that all I know is her name. First name is Heidi. And I know that she's got healed a month before and she came back because she's empty. And if God doesn't touch her, she doesn't know how she can go on. And the word I get is, Heidi, God wants to know, do you want the nation of Mozambique? She says, yes. And I said, God is going to give you the nation of Mozambique. You'll see the blind see, the deaf hear, the lame walk, and the dead be raised power of God came on her and for seven days and nights she's trembling, she's laughing she's crying, she's shaking, she can't move, she hears the audible voice of God she, God tells her that there's going to, he speaks and says hundreds of churches and thousands of people she said God how can that be, my husband Raul and I have started four churches in 17 years how could we have, and it's almost killed us how could there be hundreds of churches God gave her the faces of 12 men to ask her to join, ask them to join her, which she did, and they all did. And he said, now you prophesy to these men what Randy just prophesied to you when she did. And God gave them a similar experience. And I never have seen such dedicated, laid down lovers of God than, than those men were. They were so impacted and so touched. And through it, over 480 dead raisins are now reported the two northern provinces, which was almost 100% Muslim, are now considered by the government to be Christian provinces. It was the dead raisins and the miracles, as, long, as well as the love to drill the wells and, and clothe and feed. And, and it, it, it wasn't social justice or per, it wasn't personal evangelism and social evangelism. It wasn't personal gospel, social gospel. It was bringing it all back together. And before the modernist, fundamentalist controversy, the, the gospel was together like that. It is to have impact upon us personally. It's to have impact upon our society. And all the major revivals did do that until we broke it apart. Heidi's brought it back together. One million plus people in Mozambique have come to Jesus through her ministry since that time. Two people, two million people. You know Henry Madava. We went to Henry Madava's church. It got a corporate anointing. It wasn't just what God did to Henry. As a matter of fact, for Henry, he said, God had already told me that I was supposed to be used. God, Henry was supposed to be used. Because he said, how do you reach the cities of Europe, especially Western Europe, not just Eastern Europe? And he said, the Lord told me the way my son did. Send out disciples two by two ahead of you. And then you come and preach. And tell them to heal the sick when they go there and cast out demons. 
But my church wasn't ready and I wasn't ready. And then you and your team came and God came. And you t- it touched my church. And I remember that church, it's like they were lined up. It was just so hungry. And there was just these multiple impartations that came. Henry told me later, 10 months later, I went back. I asked him what had happened. He said, well, after you left the next Sunday when I came back in, because you told our people they could do it, and they had actually gone to the streets and started praying for people, and they were so excited, it was like a buzz, that so many things was happening in the street through my people, and God says, your people are now ready, and so are you. And he said, Randy, it wasn't so much the power I felt when you came, but it was I watched God back you up. And it gave me such a faith that he'd back me up. And he said, I'll tell you what's happened. In three months, we've gone to, I've sent out a hundred of our people to three different cities. And by the time, and for two weeks before I get there, and by the time I get there, there have been 12,000 converts average in each of those three cities through the people brought to the Lord through the ministry on the streets to heal and prophesy the supernatural and the gifts of the Spirit. And then I come in for a weekend, we have 8,000 more. We have, on an average, 20,000 new converts in these three cities And since you were here, and that was just 10 months before. He said, that's the fruit. Ten years go by, and I go back, and I see Henry again. I said, now tell me what's happened. He said, we have over a million people that have come to Jesus Christ since you came and did that first meeting, and God touched us the way he did. That's three people, just three, three million new believers. I don't think that's the work of the devil. (laughs) Scores of thousands of new churches uh, just not including what, what happened in Pensacola, not happening what happened uh, with uh, Rodney Howard Brown, uh, not, happen, not counting what happened at Smithton. And I believe those are all part of one great big revival. Not four revivals, but one great big one. Just the part I know about, there's been uh, to between thirty and 40,000 new churches started and at least four million people came into the kingdom. I think that's God. I don't think that's a lying sign and wonder. I think that's good fruit. So, in the next five minutes, I want to tell you one more story, and then I want to transition into the invitation, which should take about five minutes, too. I went to the oldest Baptist church and second largest Baptist church in Argentina, pastored by two PhDs, professors at seminary. They'd had a visitation of God right after Claudio Frazen had had his visitation. The next night, one of them was teaching missions, first Hispanic to ever teach missions at Princeton Theological Seminary. Other Hispanics were mad at him, but he resigned because his church was in revival. He went to the church. And he told me this story. He invited me. I got to come down as ministering. Carlos Anacondia one night. And I would be that we took turns. It's my turn to preach. This young man came up to me. He's 25 years old. And he was a Baptist pastor, church planner, just starting a new church. Had less than 40 people in it. He came up to me. It's midnight. And he says, pray for me again. I said, Marcelo. Marcelo Diaz. Marcelo, I've already prayed for you three times tonight. He says, yes, but when Rodney Howard Brown prayed for you, he prayed for you five times. Okay. I prayed for him. This time he just didn't fall like he did the other three times. It's like some, it's like an angel popped him uppercut like that because he literally was knocked off his feet, flew back several feet, landed on the floor, and he's shaking like a fish out of water. I didn't know I prophesied. It took me years to figure out what I thought I was praying and just saying what I thought was prophetic words. I didn't know it. So I went up to him and I said, Marcelo, tomorrow is Sunday. Pray for every sick person in your church. Marcelo had never seen one person healed in his life. That following day, every person he prayed for was healed including a woman dying of fourth stage cancer. And the community nicknamed the church the Healing Church instead of such and such Baptist church. It got nicknamed the Healing Church. 
I'm in there in Argentina for 21 days. I'm getting ready to fly home. It's Marcel. He calls me on the phone. He said, where are you at? He said, I'm at the airport. He said, listen, I want you to pray for me again before I go home. You won't believe what's happened. These last three weeks, I've seen so much happen. I want you to pray for me again. I said, Marcel, I want to go home. Well, I'm not asking you to miss your flight, but if I get there in time, will you pray for me? I said, Marcel, I don't think that's a good idea. This is a public place, and, and you're probably going to fall down, and you're going to shake, and you're going to make you're going to get me in trouble. He said, Randy, I don't care what anybody thinks about me anymore. Only thing I care about is what God thinks. I'm not scared of man. I have no fear of man anymore. I said, okay, you get here. I'll pray for you. So he showed up in time, and I was right. I prayed for him, and he fell down, and he screamed, and he's shaking, and I just walked off like I didn't know him because I'm... I'm going to make sure I get on that airplane. I don't want to get in trouble. Marcellus Church became one of the greater churches in, in uh, uh, Buenos Aires. You know, I know that many of you are not evangelicals. Many of you are Pentecostal. So I just realized you haven't told enough Pentecostal stories. So I just got to give you one. I'm at Assemblies of God Church in Oklahoma City. It's a round church. On the south side, it's a big church. And... Uh, uh, they asked me to pray for people, and they've lined up a bunch of, uh, of pastors. And so I go down the line. This is important. There's no prophecy at all. None. I don't say one word, and I just pray for them. Fill, 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 fill. And they all fell down. I couldn't have told you by looking that one of them got more than another. They all looked pretty much the same. There was not this wild craziness. Not, none of this, no sweating, no screaming. It, they all look pretty much the same. I couldn't have told you one got more than another, but one did. Several months later, I go back and I'm going to the north side of the city. And they said, have you heard about one of those guys that you prayed for? I said, no. Well, he was a missionary, Assembly God missionary to Honduras. And he'd been there. Now, I forgot, I think it was 25 years, but I don't remember for sure, but I, I think it was 25 years. It's been a long time. Anyway, this guy was already Pentecostal, some was a God. He already had a healing, a, a theology for healing. He already spoke in tongues. He had already been baptized in the Spirit. But in two months... When he went back, he saw more healings and more miracles than he had seen in the preceding, I don't know if it's eight, the minimum, 25 at the max. I forgot. I wish I could remember right now. But it was years. He received a fresh filling, baptism, what do you want to call it? Don't let the language get in the way of the experience. And there was the proof and there was evidence See, if you don't think there's more, you won't be hungry for more. If you, don't, if you think you've got all there is, you can walk right by the table and say, I've already got that. <laughs> I told my son, he said, Dad, they're walking by your book, Baptized in Spirit. He said, well, I've already been. I said, ask them if they'd like to have a second one. Have them read, there's more. Let them know there's more. If you don't think there's more, why would you even come? There is more. So here is, the illustri- here is the invitation. I'm supposed to be done at 4.30, right? Is that right? Am I supposed to be done at 4.30? That's the time to be done, I think. <laughs> Don't tell me that. <laughs> we, we, need time for, we need time for impartation. Five. Okay, we're doing, we're doing really well then. All right. At 4.30, we weren't doing so well. Now that I know it's five, we're doing really well. I, I, I wanted more time for for actually praying. Um, here's the invitation. 1984, Blaine Cook comes to my Baptist church. He gives this invitation. I don't want you to come to the front just because you want to come to the front. Because I believe a lot of you are going to want to come to the front. But we need to honor what God's doing. And we need to start with who he starts with. And if you'll wait, and if we start with who God starts with, you'll see his power, and that will cause your own faith 
to rise and more will happen. So he said, I don't want you to come forward just because you want to. Now, again, I admit this is a problem for those who have no manifestations and I don't know how to get around it and I apologize for that. And I will pray for you, you know, before you leave. And I do see people who have no manifestations that get an anointing. Oh, for the invitation. I got to tell you about that one. He's from Sri Lanka. He's not a Pentecostal. Matter of fact, he thinks speaking in the tongues of the devil. And he was leader of 200 pastors. He was an overseer. And he wasn't a Baptist, but he was evangelical, kind of like a Baptist. And he, uh, the pastor of a large Southern Baptist church in Columbia, uh, South Carolina, got him to come to my meeting in Florida. And I had a private meeting with him, private dinner. Ate dinner, then I laid hands on him, prayed for him, because he'd come all the way from Sri Lanka, off the coast of India. And I prayed for him. And it was like praying for a fence post. I mean... His eyelids didn't flutter. His hands didn't shake. There's no splotching. There's no heat. There's, I mean, no, no perspiration. I mean, absolutely nothing. Not even an eye flutter, like I said. Just, just nothing. And uh, I thought, and I really wanted him to. And I, I, I say, you know, you can receive and have no manifestations and still receive. It's kind of like carrying the smallpox and don't have any manifestations, but you cause other people to get it. And... Uh, <laughs> You know what they said about Toronto is like the Beijing flu. It, 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 it's transferable. You, one person get it and it goes to the next person. And Anyway, so uh, we go to the meeting and I call up all the pastors. There's only about 30 pastors there and he's one of them. And, and he's kind of in the middle and I'm praying for him. And they're just all hitting the floor. Boom, 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 boom. I get to him. Eyelids, don't even, don't, they don't even flutter. Just, nothing. Everybody else... So at the end of the meeting, he sends a runner to me and said, tell Randy that I was very disappointed when he prayed for me. And my response was this, go back and tell him that he was no more disappointed than I was. <laughs> Obviously, neither one of us think he got any, thought he got anything. Then I found out. When he went home, he began to teach. He didn't tell him where he'd been. He didn't mention anything he had seen. And as he begins to preach the same sermon he was supposed to preach in his pastoral series of sermons, which is wonderful to have him, he had, but it wasn't on the Holy Spirit or anything. And as he's teaching, the people of his church start falling out of their seats. <laughs> and they rolled. <laughs> That's where we get the word holy roller from. <laughs> Seriously, it is true. I've seen it a few times, not very often. It didn't happen in the meeting I was at, but it happened in his meeting. They started speaking in tongues, shaking, and he's concerned. I've opened my church up to the devil. And so he called the 200 pastors in. He wants to get their counsel, and he's trying to explain to them, asking them what they think about it. But as he's talking to them, it starts happening to the 200 pastors. And <laughs> they're having that experience. And I found out later when I went to Sri Lanka for the only, first and only time I've been there, this guy who picked me up at the airport was telling me, I met a guy. I was calling people, trying to get pastors to come. And I said, do you know Randy Clark? And he says, you know Randy Clark related to Toronto? I said, yeah, do you know him? He said, uh, yes, I actually had a private dinner with him one time and he told him the story and then he said this, that continued for over six months, but I didn't know how to pastor it and it made me so uncomfortable that I don't know what to do with this that I actually shut it down. He said, and I've never been able to get it back ever. It had been almost a decade. So, I was telling that story when I was in Sri Lanka, and the guys there said, that's me, that's me, pray for me again. I promise I won't shut it down this time. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to tell that story because used to, when early days, I would tell of the most bizarre manifestation I'd ever seen, a guy from India, 25-year-old man named Samson, and this guy from Sri Lanka. 
who had absolutely not one manifestation, but he did get the anointing, and God did start using him. So I do want you to know, it is possible for those who have no manifestations for God to come upon you and start using you. My associate for 12 years in my church never had manifestations, ever, except a tear. And I would say, you can't give away what you don't have. And he, he came to me one day and said, Randy, that, when, that bothers me. You can't give away what you don't have. That really bothers me. I said, why? Is it Because I've never had any manifestations. I said, forget the manifestations. When you pray for people, do you see more happen to them now than you used to? Yes. I said, Robert, you can't give away what you don't have. I said, that's it. I don't like that saying because I, I don't feel like I have it. I said, Robert, do you see more happen to others when you pray than you used to? Yes. You can't give away what you don't have. My focus is really not manifestations, even though I've talked a lot about them. My focus is fruit. You may not have manifestations, but don't let that get in the way of your authority and your faith. And if God chooses to use you mightily, and by the way, don't forget, all these illustrations are not the people who got strengthened. These are the ones who got the commissioning. Sometimes that commissioning happens less than 50 people or less. Sometimes it's 30 people or less. Sometimes it's thousands. The size of the crowd doesn't make a difference. That's my heart. And so back to the invitation. Blaine said, don't come up to the front unless you begin to cry. You have tears, not just tears in your eyes. They're running down your face. Because that's the love of God he's touching you with. If you begin to feel your hands are getting electrified or tingling like they've gone to sleep and they're waking up or they're hot, then you should come up. That's often a sign that people have for healing. If you feel tingling on your head, You should come up. If you begin to feel like it's hot, but it's not natural heat, and you begin to sweat, that's another sign of healing. You should come up. If you begin to feel like, I feel so heavy, I can't hardly move. I feel like there's weights on me. You should come up. If you have any or more than one of those, or any of those, he said, I want you to come forward. Now, when he said that in my church, there's this guy. I told you about him earlier. On the board, got saved the night before. I didn't tell you. He was against the meeting. He was against me having a healing meeting in a Baptist church. He thought I was going to ruin the church, and he didn't believe in any of this stuff. And he got there late just in time for the invitation because he's a civil engineer and had been in a meeting. He's got his hand up against the wall because there's no room in the church to sit down. Got his hand against the wall. He hears that invitation. And what does he say? Oh, God, touch me, touch me. Uh-uh. He said this. That's a bunch of bull. That's what he said. That's a bunch of bull. And instantly he felt his hand had gone to sleep. He said, oh, I've leaned up against the wall so much I've shut my circulation off. My hand's gone to sleep and he's trying to get it to wake up. And then the other one starts. And now both hands are tingling. He's rubbing them and then they get the, the power increases and they start shaking. And this is not, I am not exaggerating this story. I can't even demonstrate it because I can't make my hands do what his were doing. They are like this. And he's coming down the aisle. His hands look like a blur. He's bent over in the glory. He's weeping. He's just not had, he just doesn't have tears come out. He's, ah, ha, 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 oh, ha, 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 he's, he's the biggest, proudest man in the church. And God is humbling him. And he didn't believe this was grace. And he's coming down the aisle this way, sweating, bent over, 
electric, everything, everything, everything he all God did to him. Not just one, did them all. And he's coming, and he saw me. He said, help me, Randy. Help me, Randy. I said, what's wrong, John? He said, this is the day of hard contacts. He said, my left eye, it, it, my contact, it's killing me. I, 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 I've cried so hard, my contact, it's killing me, and I can't get it out with my hands doing this. And then he said, help me. <laughs> and I, you know, you have to understand, Blaine had just taught on words of knowledge the, the session before. I said, John, that could, be a, 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 that could be a word of knowledge. And he said, you and those words of knowledge, I don't even believe in them. <laughs> and right then, a girl, 14 years old, named Tammy, whose dad was boycotting the meeting because he was mad because he didn't think I should be having a healing meeting in the Baptist church. And, and we're fam friends of the family. I don't say that to embarrass that family. Because that family received one of the greatest gifts of any family that week. His daughter is there, but he won't even come. God didn't get upset. God wasn't mad. Matter of fact, God's about to heal his daughter. And she pecks on John's shoulder. And she said, John, that's my eye. I just came to the optometrist. They just told me I got to have it, I gotta have it cor uh, corrected by surgery. And John stopped shaking. And he looked at her, and he said, close your eye. And he said, I command that eye to be straight in the name of Jesus. Open your eyes, still crooked. He did it four times. On the fourth time, it, it wouldn't, it, you could do that in less than 20 seconds. On the fourth time, that eye that had been so crooked was now straight. And the next night, her 11-year-old sister, Samantha, brought her to us again, to John and I. And John, by the way, was the man who said, God, you're going to kill me, you know. Samantha brought Tammy and said, we want you to pray for her healing. I said, well, she just got healed last night or yesterday. Yeah, but she's got more problems. I said, what? She said, she doesn't want people to know, but she's born with spinal bifida. And she doesn't have control of her bladder, and she has to wear diapers. She's 14 years old. She has severe seizures. She's on seven medications, and like or 11 medications and seven neurologists for these severe seizures that she has. She's also born hydrocephalic and she's had several shunts put in already. And John and I and two women, wives of two deacons of the Baptist church, this is what I want you to see. The biggest miracle that took place did not take place from any of the people who were visiting from the vineyard. God used us, us Baptists. Because he wanted us to know. He does want to use Amen. us Baptists. He wanted to encourage us. On the way home, we prayed four times. Did you feel anything? No. Did you feel anything? No. Did you feel anything? No. Did you feel anything? Yes. A little heat went down my spine. We prayed again. Nothing. On the way home, we didn't know if she'd been healed or not. On the way home, she says to her mother, because they could walk home, Mommy, do I have to wear a diaper tonight? And her mother said if she didn't wear a diaper, the, the bed was just soaked. Because it was a big girl. And her mother said, no, you don't. You don't have to wear a diaper tonight. Tammy Ferguson never had to wear a diaper the rest of her life. <laughs> Tammy Ferguson got healed of all those seizures. Tammy Ferguson was healed of, of hydrocephalic. They discovered that her spine was now fluid going down the spine. Never had to have another, everything she was healed of. It caused a problem though. What caused the problem? The fact that John was the worst Christian in the church and God was using him. And the fact that one of the other women that was prayed for, her name was Barbara, whose daughter became the pastor's wife of a great church, the pastor of a great church. She was only 14 at the time this happened. And Barbara was seated over there and hadn't been to church in months and was, she would say, backslidden. And when God fell, she had manifestations. She did not allow the fact that she was backslidden keep her from believing God was touching her. And she came to the front and Blaine prayed that famous prayer that became even more famous in Toronto. More Lord 
And when he said that, she instantly hit the floor. And we're afraid she's going to be stepped on. So two of her, her cousin, my best friend, we picked her up, carried her up to the choir. And over the next two hours, every once in a while, you'd see her head pop above the back of the last pew. <laughs> and down she was. She's drunk. We, in the 1950s, in the Baptist church I grew up in, we called it getting happy. It wasn't called holy laughter. It was called getting happy. It, too, has a history long throughout the history of the church, the joy of the Lord. But Barbara, at midnight, had to be driven home by one of her friends because she was still too drunk to drive. Here's the problem. The minority came very upset about all this and said, we don't believe this is God. I said, why? They said, because he touched John and Barbara and you know what kind of people they were. And he missed your best friend, Tom, who was a deacon, my Nathaniel. If I could have picked the most Christ-like character in my church, I would have said, it's, it's my deacon. Tommy Gooch. And who would have been up there close had been his older brother, the chairman of the deacon board, Dennis Gooch, both of whom were open and wanted to be touched. And as a matter of fact, from March till October, every Sunday on morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night, we laid hands on Tommy, who was wanting to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And it never happened. In October, we have a conference Wimber's supposed to be there if he's sick and can't come. Healing conference. That's good news. Had the, had the press there. <laughs> Where's your speaker for this healing conference? Oh, uh, he's sick. <laughs> Blaine told me he actually was exhausted and what he really needed was rest. His body was just responding to it, pushing it too hard. Anyway, Tommy's up. I'm, I'm making a point of sovereignty. You see, and there's, I'm going somewhere with this. It's going to help some of you. Tommy's singing, I'm standing on holy ground. And there are angels all around. And as he's singing it, the spirit of God that he's been seeking and receiving prayer for March through October falls on him. He barely makes it off the stage, collapses in the front row and starts speaking in tongues, which was his big thing. He didn't like that because his mother tried to push it on him too much. And... Uh, but it, it happened. As a matter of fact, I remember talking to him. And he was just so upset about tongues. And he didn't know I spoke in tongues. I kept it a secret. I didn't want to be fired. And, um, <laughs> and I trusted him. I said, Tommy, have you ever wanted to pray and you ran out of words? Yeah. I said, Tommy, don't think of tongues as a merit badge that says you're superior to everybody else. That you know, Don't think of it that way. Don't think of it that it makes you better think of it as a crutch to help you in your weakness, a tool to be used to help you. For example, have you ever wanted to pray and ran out of words? To say, have you ever been praising God's rose chair in a lily valley, bright moon star, the alpha, make the beginning and the end, and you go on and on, and you run out of words, and your spirit's still wanting to go, but your brain can't think of anything else to say? He said, yes. I said, tongues are very helpful then, Tommy. I said, Tommy, have you ever wanted to pray for somebody? You want to soak in prayer, but you run out of words to say. I said, yeah. I said, Tom, Tommy, Tom, tongues really helps then. I said, Tommy, have you, have you ever feel like you're torn up in your own spirit and your mind can't understand what's going on inside of you and you don't even know how to put into words how to pray? He said, yes. I said, Tommy, tongues are helpful then. Tommy, don't think about tongues that says that you're, you're more holy than somebody, you're better than somebody, you're, you know. Don't think of it as an, an attainment badge. Think of it as a gift to help you in these times. He said, Randy, for the first time in my life, I want this gift. Because we shifted it from one thing that people sometimes can be braggadocious about to the place of humility and the place of something that can help you. I don't want to focus on tongues at all. But I will say this. When my son was three years old or four, 
and had severe asthma and was in the middle of an asthma attack. I wasn't there. My wife started to pray for him. And this three or four year old, he had no concern about theology, Pentecostal or evangelical. He had no axe to grind, no, no point to make. He just said, looked up at his mother and said, Mommy, don't pray that way. Pray the other way. And my wife said, what do you mean, Josh? What do you mean, pray the other way? You know, Mommy, when you use the words, I don't know what they mean. <laughs> and she said, why? And he says, because it works better. <laughs> I'm not trying to do a theology thing here. I'm just saying... Every gift that's beneficial, I want flowing as many of them as possible. I want to desire the spiritual gifts, especially, especially the prophesy. But one last story before we pray. My youngest son, Jeremiah, was out at the table. He was two years old, and I had my first miracle, the one with Parkinson's. The next morning, I called my wife. I'm so excited because it's too late to call her that night to tell her about it. And she said, Wait! It happened at midnight, didn't it? I said, yeah. How'd you know it happened at midnight? She said, because Jeremiah woke up screaming with a horrible earache. And I had to pray for him till five in the morning. And if I stopped praying, he'd start screaming in pain. And Randy, I had to pray in tongues. Because when I prayed in English, he didn't stop screaming. But when I prayed in tongues, he stopped screaming. My two-year-old was not concerned about any doctrine about tongues. But I'm so glad that my wife had received this least of the gifts that has such a practical application. That's the only earache he's ever had in his lifetime. It was an attack. So, Blaine's invitation. I have been giving that almost word for word since 1984 in March. I'm going to ask you to stand in a moment. I'm going to give you 30 seconds to pray your prayer because I prayed before I went to see Rodney. I prayed two prayers that I think are really important to give you an idea I think the kind of prayers that really the Lord loves. He loves all prayer, but one of them was this. After I talked to my friend who told me about what he'd seen at Rodney Howard Brown's meeting, that more healing, I got out of bed at 3 o'clock in the morning, got on my knees, and I was praying, Lord, and I was in a dry place, really dry place. Lord, if you'll touch me one more time, I'll go anywhere, and I'll do anything you tell me to do. Lord, if you'll touch me one more time, I'll go wherever you send me. Lord, I learned this prayer from Wimber. It became my prayer. I mean it with all my heart because I'd heard him pray it. You know, you can hear a prayer and it can so impact you, you, you can make it yours. I said, Lord, I want to be a, a coin in your pocket and I want you to spend it. Any way you want. So that's the first prayer. The second prayer was this. For all of you who are pastors. All of you who have been sent here by your church. As a representative. On the way to the meeting with Rodney Howard Brown. I knew I was going. I wanted to receive an impartation. To bring back to my church. I prayed this. Lord there's only two other guys from the church. That got to come with me. Most of my people had to work their jobs they couldn't get off to come to this meeting. I am not asking that you just touch me. I'm asking, God, that's their pastor, that you would touch me and let me bring back whatever I get to my church that the ones who couldn't come could receive. I'm asking you to let me carry whatever I get back to my church. I just want to say to you that God answered that prayer 
exceedingly, abundantly above what I had actually asked or thought because I did get to carry to the world what I received. I encourage you to put in your own words and just take 30 seconds to pray because here's the way it works. It will not do you any good to tell me what you want. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. I don't have any control over what you get. My thing is to see and hear and try to speak in to what I sense God is doing. It's like going to the mail, meeting the mail person that's delivering your mail. And you say, only checks, no bills. <laughs> the mail person doesn't determine what you get. It's a sender. If you're touched in today's meeting, your affection would be misplaced if, if it's toward me. I'm only delivering packages. You don't kiss the UPS guy. <laughs> you don't brag on the UPS guy when somebody sent you a, an amazing gift. Your focus, your attention is on the sender, not the deliverer. Amen? All right, let won't you stand? Put this up there for me. I'm going to ask the uh, team from uh, my school to come and stand on, the, on both sides. Just kind of stand there. Um, they're going to help me pray. And I want you not to stop halfway up or throw the way up. Uh, I want you to come all the way up to your toes, touch the risers there. And I don't want you to come up until God starts to touch you. We will probably run out of room here. Once we run out of room here, I'm going to ask the team to help me. We're just going to try to make our way to you. And there are some times that we may have to get your attention because we can't get to you and ask you to step out into the aisle. But we'll try to get to you the best we can. It's your turn to pray. Okay, I'd ask that you'd stop praying. Keep your eyes closed, your hands up, and your air about, about waist high. Not, don't stick them way up, just kind of out like that. Just going to receive a gift. Father, in the name of Jesus, I bless the people, and I thank you that you've been so faithful. And I thank you for what you've planned and purposed to do right now. And I bless them. And I just say, come, Holy Spirit. Come, release your gifts. Come, baptize your people. Fill us afresh. Fill us anew. Come, Holy Spirit. We bless them. We bless them. In the name of Jesus, we pray for your angels to be at work with us and cooperate with the, the falling of your spirit in Jesus' name. Now just wait. If you're crying, if you're trembling, if you feel that heat, any of those things I talked about, then I do want you to step out of your seat and make your way down to the front. More, Lord. Bless what you're doing. Bless what you're doing. More, God. Come all the way up to the front till your toes touch the risers. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. God, we bless what you're doing to this guy. We bless this baptism of love in Jesus' name. More, God. More, Lord. Deeper, 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 God. Deeper, Lord. Deeper, God. Deeper, Lord. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. More, God. More, Lord. 
more, God. In Jesus' name, touch her, God. Touch her, Lord. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, God, I bless him. In the name of Jesus, in Jesus' name, I bless him, Lord. In the name of Jesus, God, I bless what you're doing, God. In Jesus' name, more, Lord, more, God. We bless her, God. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. More, deeper, deeper, more, God, more, Lord. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, I bless him, God. Release an anointing through him to his church in Jesus' name and upon this woman in Jesus' name. We bless what you're doing, God, in the name of Jesus, that there be a transference of anointing from my life to theirs. In the name of Jesus, God, in the name of Jesus, more, more, Lord. We bless him, God, in Jesus' name. Increase the anointing in Jesus' name. More, God, more, Lord, more, Lord, more, Lord. God, Padre, en el nombre de Jesús, libera tu presencia aquí, libera unción para el ministerio de sanidad. En el nombre de Jesús, en el nombre de Jesús, libera transferencia de unción desde mi vida para tu vida. Y en, en el nombre de Jesús, multiplica y intensifica tu unción, unción, fuerza. Más, más, Señor, más, más, Señor, más, toca sus manos. Genalo, 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 genalo. Talk to his corazón. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, the better visions. In the name of Jesus, multa unción, multa unción. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, más señor más. Talk, touch him, Father. Touch him, Lord, in Jesus' name. We bless him, God. In the name of Jesus, God, we bless him. Jesus' name. Jesus' name. More, God. More. More, Lord. More, Father. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, God, we bless him. We bless him, Father. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Fill him up, God. Fill him up, Lord. Fill him up, God. Fill him up, Lord. More, Father. Genelo. More. More. More, God. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Touch him, God. Touch him, Lord. In the name of Jesus, God, we bless him. Bless him, Father. In Jesus' name. More. More, God. In Jesus' name. We bless her, Lord. In the name of Jesus. Touch her, God, in Jesus' name. Touch her, Lord, in Jesus' name. God, touch Lowell's again. In the name of Jesus, increase the anointing on his life. In Jesus' name, more, God. Increase the anointing. I pray, God, that you would release a revelation, a, 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 a gifts of revelation to him. I pray, God, in Jesus' name, that be an increase in the gifts of healing in his life and prophecy. He could prophesy destiny in people's lives, prophesy the, the dreams that they have and the secrets of their hearts, Father. We pray for increase uh, for his work in the Boys and Girls Club and the prophetic gifting in that area, Father. In the name of Jesus, we bless him, God. Bless him, bless her, God. In the name of Jesus, more, God. Fill her up, God. In the name of Jesus, I bless your hands in Jesus' name. I bless your hands in Jesus' name. More, God. More, Lord. More, Father. In Jesus' name, bless her, God. Bless her, Lord. In the name of Jesus. More, Lord. More, God. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. God, we bless your joy. We bless your joy. In Jesus' name. More, God, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, God, we bless him, bless him, more, God. Come, Holy Spirit, touch him, touch him, Father, in Jesus' name, touch them, Lord, in the name of Jesus, touch them, God, in Jesus' name, increase your anointing, increase your anointing, God, in the name of Jesus, more, God, more, Lord, more, God, more, we bless him, God, we bless him, God, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, God, increase your anointing. Increase your anointing, God. 
in the name of Jesus. More, Father. I bless him, Father. In the name of Jesus. 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 More, God. More, Lord. More, God. Bless her, God. We bless him, Lord. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. More. Fill her up, God. In the name of Jesus. Touch her, Lord. Touch her, Lord. Touch her, Lord. Their power, your presence. In Jesus' name. More, God. More, Lord. More, God. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. More. We bless her, God. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. More, God. More, Lord. More, God. More, God. We bless her. In the name of Jesus. Increase your anointing, God. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. More, Lord. More, God. We bless him, God. In Jesus' name. We bless him, Lord. In Jesus' name. More, God. More. In Jesus' name. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Touch her. Touch her, Lord. In the name of Jesus. Fill her up, God. In Jesus' name. More. God, I bless him in Jesus' name. Release your gifts through him. In Jesus' name. To him and through him, God. In Jesus' name. To him and through him. In Jesus' name. More, Lord. More, God. Fill him up, God. In Jesus' name. More, Lord. God, we bless her in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, God. More, Lord. More, God. More, Lord. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Multiply your power in her hands. In Jesus' name. God, we bless him. We bless him, God. In the name of Jesus. There it is. Thank you, God. More. Fill him up, God. In Jesus' name. More power in your hands. God, we bless what you're doing in his hands. In the name of Jesus, we bless those hands. In Jesus' name. More, God. More, Lord. Bless him, God. In Jesus' name. More. More, Lord. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. God, bless Pastor Nick. In Jesus' name, increase the anointing on his life. In the name of Jesus, more. I bless the woman in the brown dress. Got your hand right up here. I bless you in Jesus' name. I just bless those tears. I bless, he wants to give you a baptism of love. Just, just let him love on you. God, I bless her in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, more for Nick, God. In the name of Jesus, touch him, God. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, fill him up, God. Fill him up, Lord. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, more, God, more, God. Come, Holy Spirit, touch this man. In the name of Jesus, touch him, God. In the name of Jesus, we bless him, God. In Jesus' name, your power, your power go into his body, into his, into him. In Jesus' name, regenerative power. In Jesus' name, Jesus' name, regenerative power. In the name of Jesus, we bless him, God. We bless him, God. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, more, Lord, more, God. God, we bless her in Jesus' name. We bless her, God. We bless your presence. We bless your peace. Bless your power. Let it just flow. Flow through her body in Jesus' name. More, God. Your power, Lord. Flow through their bodies in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. God, we bless her. Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Your power, God. Flow through her in the name of Jesus. More, God. God, we bless him. Bless what you're doing. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, God. Bless what you're doing, God. More, God. More, Lord. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Fill her up, God. Fill her up, Lord. Fill her up, Lord. Fill her up, God. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the spinner this way. More, God. More, Lord. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. More, God. <laughs> God, use him mightily in this area of Connecticut. 
God, use him, Father. I pray you increase authority and increase power and increase understanding of your ways. God, that he would, God, he would teach the people of this region, Lord, in such a way that they'll come into a greater understanding of, 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 of your ways and an increased faith. And I pray, God, that there, you would cause there to be an explosion of healing, God. Uh, in this church, in Jesus' name, we pray, God, to increase in transference of anointing, God, in Jesus' name, for Pastor Glenn, we bless him, Father, in Jesus' name, we bless him, God, in Jesus' name, we call forth revelatory gifts, God, in Jesus' name, and gifts of faith, gifts of healing, in the name of Jesus, God, bless him, Lord. Bless him, God, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, fill him up, God, in Jesus' name, touch her, Lord, touch her, God, touch her, God, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, more, Lord, more, God, more, Lord, touch them both, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, more, God, more, Lord, more, God. In the name of Jesus, more, more. Thank you, God. Don't move your feet. You're going to step on somebody's hand. More, God. More, Lord. Bless her. In Jesus' name. Bless those tears in the name of Jesus. More, God. More, Lord. We bless the tears in Jesus' name. More, Father. More, Lord. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. More. Fill her, God. In the name of Jesus, more, God. More, Lord. More, God. In Jesus' name. More, Father. In Jesus' name. Jesus' name. More, God. More, Lord. Bless him, God. Jesus' name. Thank you. Thank you. Touch him, God. In the name of Jesus. God, we pray that there'd be a release of healing and words of knowledge and prophecy, particularly, Lord, in Jesus' name. There would be a working of miracles in Jesus' name. More, God. We bless what you're doing in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. More, Lord. We bless what you're doing here in the name of Jesus. More, God. More. The guy I talked to, I thought with John about, help me, John. Help me. Help me, Randy. Help me, Randy. Yeah. I bless you. In Jesus' name. More, God. More, Lord. More, God. More, God. We bless her. Bless her, Lord. Bless your power. Bless the power of God on her in Jesus' name. More, God. More, Lord. Multiply your power, God. God, do to him what you did to John. In Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Your power flow into him. The name of Jesus. More, Lord. More, God. In Jesus' name. God, I bless this man in the name of Jesus. Let him carry a greater anointing for healing as an elder, God. In the name of Jesus. We bless him. We pray, Father, that there would be an increase. An increase in healing, anointing, and increase God your power flow from his hands in the name of Jesus bless him God in Jesus name increase your anointing God release revelatory gifts that would build faith in them in Jesus name in Jesus name more God more Lord more Lord we bless her in Jesus name we bless her in Jesus name we bless him in Jesus' name. More, God. A baptism of your spirit in Jesus' name. A filling. More, Father. I bless your presence on this man in Jesus' name. More. He's touching right now. That's the Lord. I bless it in Jesus' name. More, God. Touch this woman in Jesus' name. Fill her up, God. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. More, God. We bless him, God. In Jesus' name, more, God. God, increase your heat, your presence, your glory. In the name of Jesus, more, God. 
God, because of the office he's in, God, give him the grace he needs in the name of Jesus. There will be a transference of anointing from my life to his. God, activate words of knowledge, prophecy, and gifts of healing, faith for miracles in Jesus' name. More, Lord. More, God. We bless him in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. More, God. Fill her up, God. Fill them up, God, in the name of Jesus. More, Lord. More, Father. In Jesus' name, God, I bless him. In Jesus' name, increase the anointing, God. Holy Spirit, anoint him. Anoint him, God, in the name of Jesus. Anoint them, Father. We pray increase and increase in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. More, Lord. More, God. More, Lord, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, more. We bless her, God. We bless her, Lord, in the name of Jesus. God, I bless what you're doing this man, in Jesus' name, at baptism of love, in Jesus' name, more, God, more, Lord, at baptism of love, in the name of Jesus, more, God, more, Lord, thank you, thank you, God, thank you, God, thank you, God. Jesus' name, more. God, more, more, Lord. Bless him, bless him, God. Bless him, Lord, in the name of Jesus. God, fill her with more love. Fill her with more love, more of your presence, more of the manifestation of your grace in her life. We bless her, Father, in the name of Jesus. Bless what you're doing in her life today, oh God, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, more, God, more, Lord. We bless her, Father, in the name of Jesus, God. We just bless her, your presence, your peace, God, your presence be on her. In the name of Jesus, God, in the name of Jesus, more, Lord, more, Lord. We bless him in Jesus' name, God. Jesus' name, Lord, release your presence, your power in Jesus' name. And bless him, Father. Let your kingdom come on him in the name of Jesus. Let your kingdom come on him in Jesus' name. God, we speak blessing over him and healing to him in the name of Jesus. In, in the name of Jesus, God. Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. More, God. Fill her up, God. More, more, God. Bless your hands. I bless your hands in Jesus' name. More, more, God. More, Lord. Bless your hands in Jesus' name. Jesus' name. More.